Stuart, it gets even better now because uh, we're going to go to Spain and it's the uh, it's the Barcelona derby, Espanol against Barcelona. So you've got a team in 20th place that actually hasn't mm-hmm. won uh, in the league at home since last season. Third manager in charge or head coach in charge. All right, what, what could go wrong? It's Abelardo, right? He's a former Barcelona mm-hmm. player, right? So he's kind of like a, a, a an, an inside agent for Barca. Surely they're going to win. But no. Uh, and joining us to discuss this, it's Sid Lowe. Sid, I thought Barcelona were were really, really poor in the first half and not good at the end. Am I wrong? No, I think you're basically right. I think what we saw was a, a little bit of what we see quite a lot from Barcelona in the first half of games. And, and Valverde was asked about this after the game. I, I think it's six times now this season that they've started uh, the game behind. They've been able to turn that around, I think, four of the six times, uh, but not all of them. And, and it does suggest, I think, maybe a... Maybe a sense of either overconfidence or just a sense that oh, we're too good for this lot. There isn't that intensity about them. There isn't a, a kind of a real sense of purpose, I don't think, quite often in, in the first half. And so for the first 20 minutes, it was curious watching it, actually, because obviously Espanyol score after, what is it, 22 minutes, I think they score. The one time they've really ventured up the pitch is a free kick on the right-hand side, curled in and, and headed in. And Barcelona are kind of looking around going, well, what happened? Because that came from nowhere, which is true. It did come from nowhere. But nor had Barcelona, I think, done enough to put the game in a position where, where Espanyol weren't always going to be offered that opportunity. And I did think in that first 20 minutes that Barcelona kept the ball almost entirely. It was must have been close to 75% possession. And yet the ball was being circulated very slowly. There wasn't a sense of, of, of kind of real intent about what they were doing. And you kind of felt like they were just playing thing. well, you know, it'll happen. What happened in the first half is, is is a repetition of something we've seen a lot. Right, so, so this isn't necessarily. It's not awful. It's not awful. But what it is is it, it, it lacks a, a realness. If you see what I mean. No, I I would argue it's awful because you're playing a very bad team. You're n- clearly not going in there with with the right mindset. If you can create yes. nothing, this manager yep. has been here, and then mm-hmm. we'll we'll get to Vidal later. But this manager has been here now for two and a half years, right? I, I know time flies and you're having a good time, but. Damn. Hey, Stuart, I don't you, think many people are having a good time. That's the point. Well, you've, you've summed it up really, or Sid summed it up as well. Lack of urgency in the first 20, 25 minutes. Thinking that if you keep passing the ball, possession football, you'll eventually break the opposition down. But it's the wrong way to go about things. You were a coach. Is that yeah. your coach's job, to give them the right you Give them the mindset. right philosophy, the right mindset. You start the game quickly. You see, when you see Liverpool play at their best, they start very quickly. They get themselves in front, and then they can control the game. At the moment, Barcelona are doing it the wrong way round. They're trying to play possession football for the first 20, 25 minutes, or until they score a goal, or until they're forced to come out when the opposition score, like they did at the weekend. And then they play with the urgency they should be playing with at the start of the game. Sid, I know you I know you love expected goals. Um uh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so Barcelona this I just checked it. Barcelona this season, uh they have scored 46 non-penalty goals in in the league. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. their expected goals is around 29. Now, just to give you a little bit of context. This is called overperforming expected goals by a tremendous amount. Mm-hmm. Now, it's true that great players, because they're so good, and Lionel Messi is obviously very, very good, um, will tend to overperform expected goals, but not by this amount, not by 50% halfway through the season. Um, and Real Madrid, incidentally, are the opposite. I mean, they're right around where they should be in terms of, of goals and expected goals. And what I want to direct to you is this team. They just don't create that many chances. And I'm wondering, um, I, I know Vidal's been an issue when we talked about the, uh, the, the the lack of urgency, and it almost seems too obvious to say, oh, look, you know, the crazy guy with the funny haircut, put him on, and then suddenly there, there, there's a jolt. He's only started four games in the league this season. Arthur is walkabout, uh, whether he's injured or whether there's all those interesting rumors about him as well. Go, You can go Google them. I'm not going to get into that unless Sid wants to. Um, but why can't he get on the pitch? Why, why are we subjected well, to Rakitic? Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, first of all, I don't think the problem is necessarily Rakitic, but I, I think there is a question about, about Arturo Vidal, and, and it's, a re, it's a recurring one, right? And I'm personally very much in the Arturo Vidal camp. Now, th- there's a contradiction in this. You know, a lot of what we're talking about here, there's a contradiction in this, because we're complaining about the possession and them keeping the ball and not having intent. And yet part of the, the debate in Spain is about that this is a team that's not defined enough by possession anymore, that's not defined enough by dominating games, but they're scoring goals and they're okay in the two penalty areas, but they're not that good in, in between. And I actually think, of course, the, the answer is part of 
both of these things. The game needs to be accelerated, but they also need to be able to, 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 to dominate it and control it in a way that feels like they actually are masters of the destiny of the game, if you see me, that they are the ones who are going to decide how this game goes, not just what the final score is. And I think that's part of it. Their final scores this year have largely, at least at home, been pretty good. Their performances haven't. And I think that speaks to what you're talking about with the expected goals. Now, Vidal, I think here's, here's, here's a kind of, a, a, what do you call it, a, 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 a thought process for you, right? Take Arturo Vidal, right? Cut off his Mohican. Take away all of his tattoos. Give him Sergio Roberto's haircut. Make him a you know a, a nice boy that you want to take home to to introduce to your mother. Um, make him Catalan. And I think the debate around him in in, in Spain and in Catalonia would be very different. So what, I think what, there is a Valverde was talking after the game, and he talked mm. about um, that Vidal isn't an academic, whereas Rakitic yes. is. He was virtually saying that he, he lacks discipline. Was that was that the case or that yeah, the point he was I, trying to make? I, yes. That is the point I was trying to make, but there's a key element here, I think, which is, to, in fairness to Valverde, he sees that as a beneficial thing. And I personally would agree with him. Um, Not beneficial to start him, though. Uh, exactly. Like, this is the question. He sees him as a beneficial thing to kind of, if you like, revolutionise the game, to accelerate the game. And I think what happens, and, and in terms of the debate at least, is that because I think partly of the way that, that Vidal looks, and I think people don't look beyond, beyond the Mohican and the kind of carefully cultivated image of a warrior and, 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 and a, bit, a bit kind of chaotic and crazy. Um, I think people don't realise, and they, what they do is they say, that he, he's not a Barcelona player. And there's this almost, this moral outcry almost, you know, we, we're losing our, our identity and the proof that we're losing our identity is, look, there's Arturo Vidal on the pitch. He's not a Barca player. How can we be Barcelona with this guy on the pitch? But I think in a way, actually, he does some of the things that theoretically Barcelona are identified by, which others don't in the outfield. He's the only one that presses. He's the only one that chases down opponents. He's the only one that has that obsession that Guardiola had, which is go and get the ball back and get it back quickly and try and be incisive with it. Now, admittedly, to take it to, to what you just pointed out from Valverde's thing, he's not academic in the sense that positionally he's not great, and that is part of, obviously, the definition of Barcelona. Positionally, he's not great, but because he's a, a bit like that, because he's a bit chaotic, and, and be, as I say, Valverde sees this as a beneficial thing when he comes on, He's the only person really breaking through lines. He's the only person really breaking the, the structure of the game. And that, of course, might mean occasionally being chaotic and breaking the structure of Barcelona. But it also means breaking the structure of the other team. And I personally think they are a better team when he's on the pitch. Although so, it is true that the impact is greater coming from the... It seems to be greater coming from the bench than starting. Sid, I mean, I, I take your point. If When you press, by definition, you are changing the shape of your team. And if you can break the lines like that, all it takes is mobile, intelligent people to react to you. I think part of the issue with this team is obviously Luis Suarez, who I thought actually played, mm. played well in, in, in the game, and Busquets aren't going to get around the pitch the way they the way they used to. Messi obviously isn't going to gonna, isn't going to do that and he either. Really when he wants to, yeah, it puts a tremendous strain on Frankie de Jong, who incidentally got himself sent mm. off for, for, for tactical foul. I'm just wondering, I mean, taking a, a, a step back here, I'm trying to figure out what the master plan is, right? Because Artur, unless you want to give us any more information, I don't know if he's a write-off forever, but... Um, no, 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 he's not. But it's going to be a while before before we see him again, yeah? So, yeah, so. Um, Carlos, uh, Carlos Alenia, who I got friends who are big Barcelona fans, rave about him and he's brilliant and whatever and he should be in there and blah blah blah. It was like a stick to beat Valverde with but the dude's gone now so he's out of the picture. Um, they just don't have that many options in central midfield unless you want to play Sergio Roberto there on, on a regular basis. So what's the, is, is there a master plan here? Are, are, are they not realizing that this team is getting substantially older in its key positions and they still have this terrible addiction called Messi Dependencia. Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, right, is there a master plan? This is part of the big debate, is the sense that there isn't an overarching plan, the sense that there isn't a clarity of ideas. Where does this go? And I think you're right. That question has been raised and raised repeatedly. Um, I suppose, in fairness to Barcelona, at club level at least, maybe maybe not necessarily in terms of the, the, the management of the team daily, but at club level at least, you could argue, well, yeah, there is a master plan. The master plan is Artur, who, who obviously is a relatively new player. And the master plan is De Jong, who is a brand new player this season. And these two players, in theory at least, are young enough and to go back to that 
recurring debate, are of a Barcelona identity. They theoretically fit, fit the idea of what Barcelona should be. Now, in the case of De Jong, much more than Artur, because Artur is a, is a player who withstands pressure, turns away from pressure, plays passes, keeps the ball moving, um, and is, is sort of similar-ish to Xavi in, in some of the things that he does. Now, I think that's a big leap, by the way, but I think there are similar elements to, to Xavi. De Jong, I think, is, is probably closer to what they what they will need in, in, in the coming years because he, it feels to me, has a little bit of that hybrid thing. He's got the physicality and the, and the ability to cover the ground, which perhaps doesn't always get seen as part of the Barcelona model, if you like, and I think that's going to be really important to him. I think with Busquets, Busquets is a curious one because I... I'm a bit like you in that I look at him and think he's not covering enough of the pitch. Maybe he's part of the problem. And yet, actually, well, there's no doubt about it, the worst performances Barcelona have had this year have been when he hasn't played. And they haven't had that player that can, is, is there can a get suggestion, through the pressure. Sid, is there a suggestion, and I've watched him for the Dutch national team a couple of times this season, De Jong is slowing things down. He's taking far more touches than he did when he was playing for Ajax. He twists and turns and looks at a pass, then twists away from it again, rather than playing a little bit quicker as he was doing last season with Ajax. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a little bit of an element of that, although I think he's played pretty well this year, but I, I think there is an element of that. I mean, and obviously, you know, you will understand this far mm. better than me. I, when I look at a player and, and, and that kind of thing happens, and he's not the only one that it happens to, I think in, at times it happens to, to Rakitic, I think at times it, it even happens to Artur, I mean, Vidal is totally different in his mindset. But I look at it and I sometimes think, but is this about that player or is it about the system? Is yeah, it and they can't see the next pass because there's not exactly. enough fluency, there's, they're not doing the same exactly. things week in, week out, the coach doesn't tell them no- what they, what's required of them in these situations, so players are playing a little bit off the cuff and then they don't always see the right pass. Yeah, and also they haven't got, I mean, to, to take it back to how Gab introduced this whole idea, they haven't got that movement in front of them that they would once have had, you know, so, so there isn't, for example, you take, you take the, the, the Guardiola model and you have Guardiola telling Thierry Henry, I don't care how great a centre forward you are, you stay on the wing, you open the pitch out, you offer that at exit point, why? So that Andres Iniesta can go into the kind of, if you like, the, the internal lane alongside you. Um, and you know, or you have someone like Pedro, who there's no way Pedro was one of the most talented players at Barcelona, but he understood that structure so much better than others, and he gave those kind of movements. And so you look at it now, and you think, I mean, you know, there's no doubt about it. Griezmann's a brilliant player, Messi's a brilliant player, Suarez is a brilliant player, but the mechanism in front of De Jong now is different to the one that midfielders four, five, six years ago had playing in front of them. I mean, it's different even when you haven't got Neymar, because at least Neymar was stretching the team forward, was going out wide to come back in. The, the, there were different movements, and I, th- I think part of it does feel systemic rather than about individuals. Sid, last question, just because I'm obsessed with pretending I'm a director of football. I I look at this, and Messi's in his 30s, Suarez is in his 30s, uh, Busquets is in his 30s, Vidal is in his 30s, Rakitic is in his 30s, Piquet, who, by the way, I think quietly is having a tremendous season, is also yes, well is. in his 30s. Okay. Um, Jordi Alba is, is in his 30s, too. He, that, that went quick. Um, Griezmann's going to be 28, 29. I mean, he's, 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 you know, he's not, he's been a kid for a very, very long time. Do they have any kind of, I mean, you, you mentioned De Jong and, uh, uh, and Artur there. Is there any kind of, is this something that's talked about? How, you know, they need to, they're moving towards a cliff edge. You don't want to have a situation where, you know, your team and key players who are still vital to you because you don't have a decent game plan, um, they all get old at the same time. Is, is this something that's that's part of the debate or do they just think, oh, that's all right, Ansu Fati will fix it. He'll turn into, just as Ronaldinho handed the baton to Messi, Messi will hand it to Ansu Fati and we'll be fine. Yeah, look, I mean, it is part of the debate and it's part of the debate for, for a couple of different reasons. One, obviously, is exactly the one you're talking about, the, the mechanics, if you like, of building a new team. It's also part of, part of the debate, in part, just because of nostalgia. You know, I mean, people have watched Xavi go, they've watched Puyol go, they've watched Iniesta go, and they know that Busquets' time is coming. And, of course, when Messi won the Ballon d'Or, he said that thing that he can't unsay now. He said, my retirement is coming near. And the impact of that was absolutely gigantic. And I think there was an emotional kind of, oh, God, don't say that. And of course, once he said it, he can't unsay it anymore. And I think the, if you look at the response to what Messi said, it's really, really interesting. Because instead of saying, OK, we've got this in hand, uh, and by the way, it's worth pointing out here that Neymar was the succession plan, and that got screwed over by Paris Saint-Germain, what is it, two, three years ago now. 
that was the succession plan. This was a guy who was going to be brilliant alongside Messi and then continue to be brilliant beyond Messi. And then there would be someone coming below him, which at that point, I don't think they'd identified as Ansu Fati. But of course, now they kind of grab on to Ansu Fati. It's like, this is our saviour. It's going to have to be, which is a hell of a lot of pressure on him. But when Messi said that, the, re- the reason I say the reaction to it was interesting was rather than talk about it in terms of a, a, a succession plan, everyone kind of rushed around saying, no, it's, it's all right. We've still got loads of years of Messi left. And instead of saying, you know, this is natural, it's what's going to happen, we're, we're working on it, or there's a plan in place. It's like, no, 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 don't worry, Messi's still going to be here. So even in the moment in which we're talking about what happens after Messi, there was a kind of Messi dependence. The response was to say, don't worry, he's not going yet. Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+.